Okay. And we are live with Nikima Levy Armstrong, civil rights attorney, activist, longtime watcher of the justice system and the education system in the Twin Cities and beyond, nationally known speaker, author, just an all round good person. Also, my god sister for years, somebody that I trust immensely uh, to sharpen me as I'm like thinking about activist actions. Kima, welcome. Thank you for joining. Thanks for having me, Chris. So here's where I want to start. I want to start with the fact that m my organization, Bright Beam, put out a report a while back called The Shame of Progressive Cities. That report was meant to highlight inequities within cities that are um, college educated, very college educated, very progressive with lots of resources, um, but still have an enormously wide gap in what's happening between black and white people in those cities. And we focused on education, but as you and I know, it's more than education. It's also things like home ownership and, you know, other like racial disparities. But Minneapolis and, and St. Paul were on that list. And people came at me back then, like, how dare you talk about these progressive cities as if, you know, they're like, you know, trying to make things bad for kids of color. And, and, and some other people who had you know, people of goodwill were asking me, well, what do you think the problem is? Like, why, why do you think it is? We get that it's inequitable, but why? Right now, we are in a situation where the Minneapolis Public Schools has a major plan to overhaul the district. And this might be a good micro uh, lesson on what can go wrong for equity in a city when public officials are not responsive to communities of color. So can you help help me set it up I don't know all the ins and outs of this plan that the Minneapolis public schools are doing, but set it up of why you think it's not really hitting the equity mark like it says that it's supposed to. Mm -hmm. Well, first, I want to thank you for the report that came out of Bright Beam. I think it was really enlightening. Um, as you may recall, I wrote an op-ed that appeared in the Star Tribune highlighting the report and some of the issues that happen here as far as folks claiming to be progressive, but not really being progressive when it comes to communities of color and children of color. And there was so much commentary about that report. And so thank you all for your contribution to this conversation on how to achieve education equity. Um, now, the other night, as you know, we had a virtual town hall forum here in the Twin Cities, particularly Minneapolis focused on a new plan that is coming out of Minneapolis Public Schools called the Comprehensive District Design Plan or the CDD for short. Mm -hmm. And essentially the reason that we had a town hall forum was because the district has decided that in the midst of a global pandemic, they have the authority to uh, make a decision that is going to change the face of Minneapolis public schools as we know it. And the fear is that it's, it's going to change the district, but not in a good way. Mm -hmm. um, they have not given enough space for community voice. And so uh, at their last school board meeting, they had asked people to call in ahead of time to give comments about the plan. And um, there were over 300 phone calls, many of which were garbled. Um, there was limited participation by folks who don't speak English, and the majority of, of folks who called in were actually against the plan. And that's mm. what Minneapolis Public Schools calls community engagement, right? So we think it's unconscionable for Minneapolis Public Schools to move forward with the CDD. This is a plan that um, administrators and I'm guessing some staff hatched behind the scenes and they are selling it as an equity plan. Essentially, um, one of the things that they claim that they're trying to do is correct some of the um, inequities that have existed for a long time. Back when you were on the school board, you had constant concerns about all the resources being funneled into Southwest Minneapolis, which is for those who don't know, one of our um, most affluent parts of Minneapolis and also uh, one of the whitest parts of Minneapolis, um, and resources not being distributed equitably throughout the district. 
uh, where a lot of um, students of color actually live. And this has been an ongoing battle for a number of years. Uh, rather than correct these inequities, resources had continued to be funneled to Southwest Minneapolis. And so, and you let know, me just make a point about that really quick, uh -huh. because anybody listening to this in any other part of the country has to know that we're using Minneapolis as a as an example. But this could be going on anywhere in Minneapolis. Southwest Minneapolis is the wider, wealthier part of town with the million dollar homes and more expensive um, um, properties and also a lot of social and political power to di directly hijack the um, the political apparatus of the city. But in, in Seattle, North Seattle is the same way. And I can keep going on a list of other cities where there's that part of town and that part of town and they get unequal distribution of power and 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 um, and money. Um, Zakia just jumped in and said the same issue here in Montgomery County, Maryland. Um, I, I bet anybody listening to this has this scenario going on. But I don't want to stop you. Keep going because I actually feel like Minneapolis is like one of the capitals of this double talk, this progressive double talk on equity. Absolutely. So um, when you think about uh, what happens in, in a city where um, there's a lot of socioeconomic inequality and inequity, it's very easy to see how one part of the city uh, can receive um, more than their fair share of resources and another part of the city or other parts of the city can be depleted. Um, and then when the outcomes are different between those various parts of the school district, it's very easy for people to look and blame the parents, blame the community to claim that they don't care about education, yeah. rather than look at the built in inequities that are contributing to the disparity. So I'll give just an example of that. Um, when you go to the Minnesota Department of Education's website, Up, oh, I think you froze for a moment there, Nakima. To the viewers, I am trying to get a. Uh, Get in touch with Nikima. It looks like she froze there in midpoint, a very strong point. So this is a uh, this is a bad place to end on. <laughs> okay, I think she's going to jump right back on. I should say this um, while Nakima is getting back on online. This plan in Minneapolis is one of many um, redesigns of the, the district that has happened over more than 40 years. Every, you know, every uh, five to 10 years, there's a big plan. There may be a new superintendent or there may be a new school board and there is a, uh, a big plan. Change, we're gonna change the district. We're gonna move things around. And we're going to make things more equitable. Oftentimes, what they really are, are are plans to save money because there are budget problems. Minneapolis has a budget hole at least thirty million dollars of a budget hole. Most of that could be recouped if uh, special education were fully funded in the district. So there is a cross subsidy of special education that the state is not covering of more than thirty million dollars. So when you have uh, um, debts like that, deficits like that, and they grow over time, you start have to uh, making decisions to lop things off. This current plan in Minneapolis is, is um, being sold by Superintendent Ed Graff as um, fixing things in three areas, academics, equity, and sustainability, with the goal of providing every student uh, in MPS a well-rounded education. So that's the way it's being pitched. As you can hear from Nakima, though, that's actually not the way that the plan is landing. We got you back again, Nakima. 
I'm sorry about that. I don't know no. why I got booted out. You froze for a second. I was like, oh no. See, I was about to give people a lesson on what the internet is like in Minneapolis based on the map, too. <laughs> right. right. That, that north side internet is not as strong in Minneapolis as it is in Southwest. No, it is not. It's, it's know, really it's sad. Um, anyways, you were making a point. You were you were making a point um midstream, and you were about to give an example with the Minnesota Department of Education's website uh of inequity. Yes, thank you. So um, if you go to the Minnesota Department of Education's website and you look up various schools, one of the things that you'll see is that the schools that have the highest concentration of uh, white students and um, the lowest concentration of students who receive free and reduced lunch are more likely to have the most experienced teachers and the teachers with the highest credentials. Mm -hmm. That And, you know, the opposite is true when you look at schools that have the highest concentration of black students and the highest concentration of um, kids who receive free and reduced lunch, they're more likely to have um, teachers with the least amount of experience and the lowest credentials. Mm -hmm. That is a built-in inequity that is baked into the system. And we know that so many of the studies talk about the impacts of teacher quality on uh, learning outcomes for students. And so if by design or if teacher selection is playing a role, our schools in North Minneapolis, which is where I live, um, which has a high concentration of uh, people of color, um, lots of socioeconomic inequities, lack of political power, um, our students are not necessarily being given access to teachers who have the greatest amounts of experience to teach our kids. Mm -hmm. And one could argue that th this is where the teachers need to be. Right, because a lot of white parents ha may have um, bachelor's degrees or um, other uh, types of degrees, master's degrees, et cetera, themselves. So they're actually able to supplement, they're able to teach their kids. If their children need tutoring, they're able to find tutors or take them to a learning center. Whereas in North Minneapolis, if parents um, uh, you know, aren't able to um, explain something to their children. There are no learning centers that they can go to. They're just stuck, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And their mm -hmm. child will be impacted. And so you would think that, you know, you would want to uh, shift those inequities by how you design the system, right? To begin to um, address some of those inequalities, but that's not what the district has done. The district has decided to reshuffle thousands of students around um, to shift some very popular programs that are in one part of the district over to the middle of the district. That's going to cause thousands of children potentially to exit Minneapolis public schools. Um, they have not looked at the impacts to um, our Latino families from the policies that they're putting forward. Um, and our now, on, that, on that point, I saw a town hall that you did recently, and you had a speaker, a guest speaker, who said that a seventy-five percent of English language learners are going to be reshuffled. Yes, they're going to like be taking the brunt of the move arounds, like you know, not move arounds. You know, shifting Shuffling people around. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, seventy-five percent of of uh, English language learners are going to be shuffled. That's crazy. Yeah. That's and that. Um, it is. It's unconscionable. Yeah, and and you know that they wouldn't expect that there would be any pushback on that. So so for listeners, just here's a couple of things about the plan because I, I have this down written down. It reduces the magnets from 13 to 11. It eliminates uh, open education, international baccalaureate, environmental magnet options, replaces them with global studies and humanities, STEAM. It centralizes all career and technical education. Now, I was about to say, Nakima, what, what's so bad about this plan? That sound, you know, they're just getting rid of a few magnets. They're centralizing <laughs> things. They're bringing stuff to the middle of the city. They're working to integrate public schools. I mean, what could be so bad about this plan? Now, this is where you start getting into the proof of uh, the, 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 the details. So one of the things about um, centralizing the plans, they're going to centralize all career and technical education programs. But in the working class and, and underclass high schools, they're going to put things like um, uh, machine tool, welding, low-end healthcare, um, magnet type programs, construction, auto, and agriculture at the working class high schools and underclass high schools. Um, the better high schools are going to get business law 
<laughs> right. Mm -hmm. So, so like talk about a, a rebirth of tracking. You have to actually really pay attention where people put things and the fine details when they say things like, oh, we're just going to centralize or we're going to reshuffle the programs. And then you ask the question where, and you see that the best teachers are going to one part of the district. The best programs are going to one part of the district. The programs that put people on path for good, you know, good, good stations in life are actually going in the better parts of town. Mm -hmm. um, but but let me go back to my question. What's so bad about all this, Nakima? Like, you know, reducing magnets, uh, eliminating a few programs here and there. Well, it's going to have a drastic impact on thousands of students. Initially, the district claimed that 63% of students would be impacted by this new plan. And then after they received pushback, they said, oh, uh, now it's just maybe 35% who are going to be impacted by the plan. Mm -hmm. um, and they're including, you know, in, in that the students who um, switch schools every year, you know, due to maybe family circumstances, et cetera. So the reality, though, is we know that so many students are going to be impacted and we don't know what the outcome of this plan is going to be. The district mm -hmm. has never in all the years that I've attended board meetings, they have never been able to successfully implement a plan. So every three or four years, they have a new aha moment mm -hmm. and they roll out a plan that they are claiming is going to um, shift academic outcomes for students of color. And then they're presenting these annual updates you know, at board meetings and the numbers aren't changing. The mm -hmm. students are not uh, increasing um, their proficiency rates, uh, graduation rates are barely changing, and that's because they changed the rules. Um, so not necessarily because they're delivering a higher quality of education for students of color. So they tinkered around the edges in terms of shuffling students around and uh, shifting some programs around. They've also decided to change some schools from K K-8 schools to K-5 schools, which is extremely disruptive to our English language learners. So students who are Latino, who are Somali, who have learned a particular um, system inside of a school will suddenly be yanked out and placed in a different type of school, right? Mm -hmm. So think about the, the cost um, of configuring some schools um, from a K-8 to a K-5 and <laughs> trying mm -hmm. to make that work, right? Or the mm -hmm. other way around. So um, the district has said that they're going to save um, somewhere between six and eight million in transportation costs, but it's going to cost tens of tens of millions to hundreds of millions mm -hmm. of dollars to actually implement this plan. Mm -hmm. uh, beyond that, uh, the truth about equity seems to be an afterthought with, with regard to this plan. It's really more about this false notion of integration being the key to addressing academic gaps, mm -hmm. which I fundamentally disagree with. Um, I don't think that it matters who our kids are sitting in a classroom next to in terms of their capability of being successful. So, um, but that's a hallmark of this plan, right? Integrating the various schools or so they claim. So that means that some busing is gonna have to take place across the district and involuntary busing, you know, may take place as a result of that. And um, I've asked administrators, how is, um, quote unquote, integrating classrooms going to lead to increased academic outcomes for students of color when you're not um, focused very heavily on uh, increasing teacher diversity um, in addressing the overrepresentation of black boys and other students of color in special education, when you're still allowing kids to be pushed out and into alternative schools? Uh, many kids that don't even belong in alternative schools are there because um, some teachers don't want to deal with them inside of the classroom. Mm -hmm. uh, and they might need extra support or they're tired of going to classrooms and seeing white women all day. Mm -hmm. Right. And mm -hmm. not seeing a black man unless they go to the behavioral intervention room, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. unacceptable. That is a built in inequity in the system when the overwhelming majority of teachers are white and the help, you know, the the. Um, the paras, the behavioral interventionists are black or other people of color. Yeah, right? and they and get those, to be the disciplinarians in the school. Absolutely, yeah. but, but they yeah. also are able to build relationships with kids because they yeah. share 
a similar cultural background, but they're not getting paid on an equitable level and they don't have any real job security, right? Mm -hmm. That's another built-in inequity within the system that's perpetuating um, the, the inequities that we're talking about in terms of academic outcomes. The plan doesn't address those things in a significant way. They mentioned, yeah, we wanna see an increase in teacher diversity, but again, it's more like an afterthought. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's a problem, you know, and then literacy, as we talked about in the forum that we had at Asada Speaks, which you participated in, um, in January, exactly <laughs> how the majority of teachers uh -huh. are not trained to teach literacy. Mm -hmm. This plan mm -hmm. is not focused on that. Mm -hmm. So how are we going to close gaps by shuffling students around and making sure that the demographics in the classroom look a certain way, but not making sure that the folks who are teaching the kids look like the kids um, and can teach and can you know this and can is, teach effectively yes this is one thing that's missing from this plan for me that is it's almost like saying that the tires are missing from a car right like the thing that's missing from this plan that's absolutely critical and essential is tell the public what you are going to do to improve instruction to improve improve learning improve classroom teaching the point that you made earlier about the distribution of teachers. I mean, there was a report that came out in Minneapolis, maybe, I don't know, a few years ago, that basically said that Bethune, one of the worst performing schools in the entire district, had all of the worst performing teachers. That the teachers with the worst evaluations were all congregated in a school where the kids needed the best teachers, right? Mm -hmm. And there wasn't any immediate rush to fix that. I mean, there wasn't any immediate rush to fix the teacher's contract so that you could fix that or make changes so that you can fix that. But that was an old problem. That was a problem in 2007, the district did exactly one of these type of plans. They had what was called the North Side Initiative where they closed five schools on the North Side, took $300 million out of the North Side, put it into the general fund, and they promised everybody that it was gonna rain educational opportunity. There was going to be better um, arts and math and access to all these things that the kids didn't have by consolidating and closing schools and closing buildings. Here we are 13 years later and none of it happened and nobody followed up on it. Two years after we did that, we passed another plan that redistricted the entire district, moved kids around, zoned, rezoned the magnets, changed the busing patterns, blah, 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 whatever. Um, the next board came in, unwound a lot of that, and it's gotten substantially worse. This plan that we're talking about right now is, is three years in the making. They've been working on this for three years, and it's only coming to roost now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the public on all sides of the fence have people that are against it. Right. Like like you do have people in, in southwest Minneapolis, you know, um, who are against this. You have some people in north Minneapolis that, that are against this. What do you think? Um, what's the problem here, Nakima? You have an elected school board, democratically elected school board in a wealthy, college educated, progressive city. Why are we having this conversation right now about uh, inequity by design? If you have all that going for you, I mean, elected school board by itself is supposed to be the end all be all. So mm -hmm. where is the power and, and why are we having this discussion if we have all that going for us? Well, the power should lie within the school board members, right? Uh, who should be taking instruction from community and also their own data, right? Mm -hmm. Doing mm -hmm. an, an, an analysis to see what are the root causes of these issues and using data to inform best practices. We don't see that happening. Um, the community has for years, as you know, been crying out for more equity, for justice, for them to change some of their policies. Rather than listening to the community, they went and formulated this plan and they're trying to sell it to us as equity. And it's really a slap in the face. There has not even been an equity audit of the entire plan. They're supposed to have, um, something called an EDIA, um, which is their own uh, internal equity audit that they're supposed mm -hmm. to do. They've only done that so far, at least what they've released to the public, uh, focus on placement, but not on the, the plan in its entirety. And that's their own policy that they're violating. So, yeah, so for people a, listening, they're supposed to do with any of these policies, they're supposed to put it through <clears> a process <throat> to say what would the impact be on equity. That was something that was passed in Minneapolis public schools yes, uh, many years ago to, as a way to have a safeguard 
that whenever there's going to be major decisions, they put it through a process to, to see whether or not it's going to be equitable. And you're saying in this case, they only did it with one part of the plan. They didn't that's do it with all the whole that, plan. That we're aware of, that's all that they've released to the public, focused on placement. And when you look at the EDIA that was done on placement, the committee worked so hard, right? It was a diverse committee that um, worked on the EDIA. And they said, we're not sure that the district is acting in good faith mm. with this particular plan. Um, we don't like the process. We don't feel that we had enough time and we don't think that the district will necessarily take our recommendations seriously. So it's with that abundance of caution, uh, abundance of caution that we're releasing our findings. Mm -hmm. Right. So mm -hmm. they had concerns even when the first EDIA was done and wow. they questioned the sincerity of the district. So that should be a red flag for any of the school board members who are voting on this plan to understand that you cannot take what administrators are saying at face value. It's up to the school board members to exercise due diligence and ask critical questions. Mm -hmm. How can you vote on a plan, which they're set now to vote on May 12th, again, in the midst of a pandemic, when you don't have clear numbers of um, the fiscal impacts of this plan? Mm -hmm. The numbers have changed. I mean, even just within the last week and a half, the busing costs changed by $10 million with no explanation. How, how is that possible that these radical shifts are still continuing to happen? Mm -hmm. um, and you're about to vote on this. So you don't have a genuine equity audit. You don't have a fiscal audit. Yet, you are supposed to be the folks who are looking out for the interests of parents and community members um, and the long-term sustainability of one of the largest school districts in the state, Minneapolis Public Schools. Over mm -hmm. 30,000 children attend. Um, and they're going to be impacted by what happens here. And so we're saying, wait a minute, pump your brakes, stop the presses, mm. go back and do an equity audit, do a financial audit. Let us have input as a public. Calling in is not adequate. We want to be uh, participants in a physical meeting where we can share how we feel about the plan and some of the built-in inequities that are a part of this plan. Mm -hmm. You cannot tinker around the edges, shuffle around students, have integration as one of your core um, elements of a plan and expect for um, academic outcomes to magically change. It is simply not going to happen. And I wanna share um, you know, how we talked earlier about them pushing this as an equity plan. Um, they've talked about the benefits uh, to North Minneapolis, again, which is where I live, and it's a lower income community. Um, I'm going to just share some stats with you. So in particular, in North Minneapolis, 57 percent of our elementary students who attend a school other than their neighborhood school will be assigned to a different school under the CDD, like forcefully assigned. Wait, how many? School. Say this again. 57 uh, percent. So the majority so of the kids in the north side will be shifted around. The elementary school students, yes. Elementary at that, wow. Yeah. yeah, so if they go to a school outside of their neighborhood school, they're going to be, 57% will be returned back to their neighborhood school, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Which, again, has an impact on choice. Um, who else will be impacted? A third of Minneapolis public school students, K through 8, uh, that attend a magnet school of which 62% are students of color because of this shuffling. They're going to be impacted. Students in the South Central Corridor that are 79% students of color, they're going to lose neighborhood schools at Jefferson, Anderson, Sullivan, and Green. They're going to lose magnet programs at Whittier, Bancroft, and Falwell. Um, families, um, immigrant families, they're going to lose their K-8 through options at Anderson, Marcy, Jefferson, Mung International, Seward, Falwell, and Barton. So wait a second now. So this is like, and I didn't know any of these figures. You're like blowing my mind right now. So the majority of the plan is being done on the backs of people of color. Let's mm -hmm. just state some obvious things here. Without much uh, public communication with those communities, what I heard from the town hall the other night were multiple different language communities saying they haven't even really engaged us around this. But there are these Facebook groups. There's one that's like 4,000 people or more, I guess, of mostly white folks talking about, about this. And they're the, major they're the minority of students and families within the district. That, but they're having the majority of the engagement with the district and the board, and the board is like really bending over backwards to make sure that they treat them very well. Um, but these numbers that you're giving to me are alarming. 
Like, so we're just going to move around all the kids of color, upset their, their relationships that they know, just change the boundaries and everything. And magically, instruction is going to become better. Magically, the district is going to know how to teach reading all of a sudden, which it's been busted for not knowing how to do. Uh, magically, the, the way that they place math programs is suddenly going to be equitable, which we've you know, seen report after report is not happening right now. But like, this isn't even an academic plan. Right. And it's being done on the backs of people of color. Absolutely. Wow. That's the problem with this plan. And the, the board doesn't want to listen. They don't even want to listen to these affluent white parents who are upset, you know, so you know it's bad when they're not, <laughs> them, right? They're, they're making little changes here and there, but they're not even willing to listen to them. Yeah, and which they, is one of the ripples I got to say to you. I read this <laughs> other op-ed by a white family that sounded racist as hell, <laughs> and they don't want the plan to go through either, which has been a wrinkle for me because there's some people that are talking in very veiled racist ways right? who want to torpedo the plan too because they feel like it's going to be, it's going to bring too much equity. Uh, right. into the into the place. Um, but Nakima still, I, I got to go back to these numbers again. So what's happening with um, the majority of the board are people of color, right? Um, you would expect them to be responsive to communities of color. We have Native American, African Americans. Uh, I think we have a Latinx person on the board. I can't remember. No, no Latinx. No Latinx board members. On the board. No. We have a we Somali, have a Somali board, board member. Board member. Somali board yeah. members. So we have one language uh, community represented on the board. You have three African-American women. Yeah. So, I mean, help me out here. I'm like at a loss. And We've white men, of course. Majority board of color. Um, and still there's a need for people like you and people in the public to be shining a light on everything that they do because it's not going to be right if you don't. Why is there still that need? First of all, let me just ask, um, how are you energizing people around this issue? Because I think a lot of people watching this are activists themselves in their mm -hmm. own communities. And I can even see by some of the comments here uh, are facing very similar issues where they are. But somehow you feel um, a lot of, I don't know what it is, but you have a lot of confidence about being able to use the power of activism when you see a situation like this. Um, what would you say to those activists in the other places who are facing similar things about being confident in their activism around these things? Well, I think that it's important to have a mindset of perseverance. And if a door closes, you figure out how do I now get through the window? Right. Mm. If my goal <laughs> is to change yeah. what yeah. is happening here. So that's kind of how I approach this situation when um, I was initially approached to support the plan. So I took a look at it and I started asking questions like there's a lot missing from this plan. If the focus is on equity, this just mm -hmm. seems to be a shuffling of the deck type situation. And I don't really see a real focus on shifting the policies and the practices that are leading to these inequities and in academic outcomes. So I can't support this plan in good conscience. And so around that time, I was approached by um, a man by the name of Toussaint Morrison. I want to shout him out because he's a man of color who runs um, a group called Site Forums, where he uses his platform, similar to what you do with Citizen Ed, to highlight issues that impact communities of color. Mm -hmm. And so we wound up doing a one-on-one -on, -one on Site Forums that was like maybe 30 minutes long, where I got to talk about the underlying systemic inequities that are not being addressed by this plan and that will persist no matter how they shuffle students around. So that wound up getting over 2000 views and that helped begin to energize people. And then I went back to the Racial Justice Network, a grassroots organization and brought this issue forward. And we said, okay, what can we do? How about a petition? So I drafted up a petition and started circulating that petition. Um, and we wound up getting over 3000 uh, folks so far to sign on to that petition, asking that the CDD be delayed and that an equity audit be conducted. So that helped to energize people. And at that time, folks from around the district started reaching out to me saying, you know, we want to work with you. We want to figure out how to build more momentum. And so I'm suddenly working with people that I didn't know before who all have similar interests in trying to ensure that uh, this plan does not um, jeopardize, you know, the education of, of thousands of students mm -hmm. uh, and that our voices are being heard. And so out of that, you know, we did a Twitter storm recently. Uh, we did the town hall forum, which 
The last time I looked had over 6,000 views um, of the town hall forum. And then um, yesterday and today, we've been encouraging people to call their school board members and make their voices heard. And we have some other actions that we're planning as well. So we're looking at a variety of ways to get the attention of the public and school board members around this issue. And we're also, you know, crunching the numbers, doing the research. We have parents who are digging into the plan and pulling out information that the public is not aware of. That's how I got those numbers that I read to you earlier. Those are dedicated parents who went in and found this information. And then we're able to then push it out to the public to give people the truth of what's actually going on. So like one example is um, at the most recent school board meeting uh, where they asked people to call in, they didn't play all the calls. They were selective in playing a percentage of the calls that were for the plan and a percentage of the calls that were against the plan. Mm-hmm. Right. So mm-hmm. there, that's manipulation. You know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the parents were able to go in. They listened to every single voicemail mm-hmm. and they were able to crunch the numbers to show. These, this is the percentage that was actually for, this is the percentage that was against, this is the number of what they played. So that's been powerful, like seeing these um, parents um, able to roll up their sleeves and really fight for what they want for their kids. And I'm just telling them like, don't give up. We have to keep applying the pressure. The other thing to realize of why put, pushing this plan forward right now is so irresponsible is the fact that we don't know what the new world is gonna look like. Mm -hmm. after we get through Mm COVID-19, right? Everyone has been impacted in some way, shape or form. The district doesn't know what its new normal is going to look like. So how can you responsibly put a plan like this forward that is going to cost tens of millions to hundreds of millions of dollars to successfully implement, if you can even successfully implement it and expect people to buy into that when you have parents, teachers and students all grappling with the impacts of distance learning, mm, right? Mm-hmm. And, and I saw a report actually a, today on that note. I saw a report that basically said that there was like 10% of the students in the district that still haven't gotten online yet because they haven't gotten the devices. Devices yes. haven't made it to them yet. Um, which, I mean, come on, man. We're, we're like at least a month into this thing. A now. month in and they don't have devices, yeah. right? And they don't have devices. Not to mention if they do get devices, do they have internet access, mm-hmm. right? That's mm-hmm. a real issue. Um, and I think the city has made their internet access um, free, but the problem is that only one person can be on at the same time. <laughs> it's, mm. it's, it's a hot <laughs> mess, right? Kind of like you've wait, seen some of my internet in the past living in North Minneapolis. Wait, wait, not only one greatest. person could be on it in the household? On one device. That's what I've been told about the city's internet, that it's slow, that it's not oh. really effective for... Um, student learning and, yeah. and family sharing, you know, and a lot of our families have large families, so it's it's not what they need. It but always has been too. slow. I'll say that much. It has been slow for years. I mean, for the people <laughs> listening or watching this right now, Minneapolis uh, as a city implemented its own um, internet plan years ago. So as a resident of the city, you can use the city's internet, but it's it's been like it, 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 like it feels dinosaur. like dial up from back right. in the day, right? The it stone feels, ages <laughs> the stone. in terms of the internet. You know, I'm waiting for that sound when it logs up. You know? Right. It's and like that's assuming, school. number one, that the quality of what they're being taught is actually good through distance learning. Yeah. Because it's caught a lot of teachers by surprise who suddenly have to adjust their lessons and figure it out. They're still trying to figure it out, you know, in uh, and many if you were bad in the classroom before. And now you're doing distance learning, right? Like if you yep. were not teaching well before, uh, or if you couldn't teach reading or the curriculum was all jacked up or, you know, you got the wrong books from the wrong publishers, which we've seen all of these, all these things that I'm saying are not. Or um, racist books from the publishers. <laughs> racist books from the publishers. Yeah. Like the, what was the lazy Lucy? I mean, I want people watching this <laughs> to know the type of wacky stuff that goes on in progressive cities and why progressives should not come for me when I point this out. So Nakima, while, since you and I have been watching the district, the district had a, uh, a social studies software program that virtualized slavery that made you a slave in the virtual uh, in a game that was virtualized. And to win the game, you had to encounter white people and say the right thing. You had to obey the master. You had to, to obey the, the master. Game. That was a social studies curriculum that a 12 year old black girl br- came home and told her parents about. And they didn't believe it. We didn't believe it. Right. 
We didn't believe that we had to fight the district to get rid of it. We had to fight the district to get that slave game out of there, which was despicable. That was one example. And then the other was that Reading Horizons curriculum where the district published these racist books for the the, um, youngest learners. You know, the character, like you mentioned, Lazy Lucy, because that was a separate situation. Lazy Lucy. Lazy Lucy. And then there was a Native American girl um, who was uh, portrayed in a racist manner. And so the district has spent over a million dollars on these books. And when we saw it, we're like, you got to get this out of here. Right. You know, and they're like, well, can't we just, no, get the cancel that contract? So we had to go fight for that to happen. Saying you can't get who who should be fired. Right. Who was supposed to adequately review these materials before they got into the hands of kids. Yeah. Right. And, that's you know, incompetence at this point. That they and that's a lot of money. That's expensive. We always talk about fully funding schools, but we don't talk about the dumb things that you do with our money sometimes, the dumb racist things that you do mm-hmm. with our money in this case. You've heard me tell this story a billion times, but when we did a plan very similar to this one 13 years ago and 10 years ago, very similar to this, we did a plan. We had 160 white people come to the district privately and say, we're going to leave the district and we're going to put our kids in private school if you zone us into the high school closest to us. Because the, cl- the, high, s- the high school closest to them was a black high school. And for years they had been allowed to, because they were a white neighborhood, ne- uh, bumped up against the black neighborhood, they had been allowed to go south and go to the whiter high school mm-hmm. for years. Mm-hmm. And when we tried to zone them into North High, which was the closest to them, um, they came with the Speaker of the House and other political people to the school board privately and basically twisted the arms of my colleagues to cut them out a special zone that gave them access to five high schools when everybody else only had access to two, right? Just for this one little carve out of white people. I only tell that story over and over and over again over the years because I want people to stop pretending that progressive cities filled with progressive people act in a way that should be called progressive or in, in, in the name of equity. How do you carve out that structural, that, that last years and systemic systemic. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's exactly what it is. And when, when I think of progressive now, based on the things I've personally been through and seeing the hypocrisy, I think of Dr. King's 1963 letter from a Birmingham jail where Mm -hmm. he spoke about white moderates. He's like, look, we're not concerned about the Ku Klux Klaners or the White Citizens Council. We're concerned about y'all who's saying y'all are friends, Mm -hmm. the good white people. Mm -hmm. Y'all are the actual problem Mm -hmm. because we know to look out for somebody with a hood on, you know, somebody at a Trump rally. We know to look out for them. But it's y'all who sometimes are wolves dressed in sheep's clothing who Mm -hmm. are doing just as much, if not more to harm our um, and deny our access to um, equal opportunity, right? Through your policies, through how you wield political power and influence and money. That's who we have to be looking out for. And so here we see it happen all the time. Then I tell people, which I learned the hard way through experience, that a progressive agenda is not the same thing as a racial justice or racial equity Mm. agenda. Mm -hmm. So don't get it twisted, Black people who are watching this broadcast and even our white friends and allies, because someone claims to be progressive does not mean that they care about racial justice and equity. Mm -hmm. I always say the proof is in the pudding. Show me specifically what you have done to advance the cause of justice or the quality of life specifically for people of color. Because a lot of times progressives are focused on this false notion of a rising tide lifts all boats. We have never in the history of America ever seen that work for our people. We've had to fight for every single game that we have. And guess what? Everybody benefits. Mm -hmm. So they Mm -hmm. need to change that to say uh, when black people rise, everybody rises. Mm -hmm. Because that's what has typically happened in terms of the laws, the policies, the resource allocations, et cetera. But we have to... Uh, push white allies and white progressives to interrogate themselves, which they have not had to do. They hide behind a shield of progressivism when sometimes they have some of the most biased views and perspectives anywhere. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I tell them, like, don't look for the Trump people looking here. 
Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> and what you're doing <laughs> that has an impact right. on our community, because right. a lot of the teachers who teach in our schools think that they are progressive. Mm -hmm. But the reality is they are the ones that engage in what some call um, the soft bigotry of low expectations, which I don't even know if I can call it soft bigotry anymore. It's outright bigotry mm -hmm. because they decide that our children are mediocre when some of them are gifted and talented but they don't get access to those resources. Our kids aren't pushed towards some of the best colleges and universities when they want to attend, you know, or even the fields of technology, whatever they want to do, right? They're being denied opportunities by people who claim to have their best interests in mind, but it's a lie. Mm -hmm. You know, they're looking at these kids and they are making decisions about their future and they don't have the right to do that, mm -hmm. right? They don't have the right to stifle um, the brilliance of black children. But that's what they're being allowed to do when they have control over them mm -hmm. um, during the school day. And the curriculum that's being taught is not reflective of their background, their history and their heritage, which means that our kids don't have a good sense of identity. All the comments going up are like, this is like activist church for people. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's like, preach. And they're like fire emojis. People are listening to this and they really, 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 I think, have needed to hear this like in the morning. Somebody needed to hear this this morning. Like, so so God is working through you. Um, a question though, if power never concedes anything without a demand, what's the demand we should be making right now of our local public schools and school boards? Well, I think that we have to not be afraid to advocate specifically for what is in the best interest of black children, mm. right? Because like I said before, when black children rise, when black people rise, everybody rises. I believe it's very similar for our children as well. Right. And if it, if we can um, hone in on solutions that work specifically for black children, like how how our kids learn, you know, our oral traditions and the impact that that has on um, a, bl a black child's ability to learn. If we get them to reform a lot of those practices that are geared with middle class white children in mind, it's going to have a positive impact on all children. It's going to have an impact on children, even in special education as well. Right. Where we're our kids are overrepresented because someone made a decision that something was wrong with them. Mm -hmm. Right. And of course, we know that there are some kids who need special education, but there are a whole lot being funneled through the doors of special education who simply do not belong there. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and who have uh, been handpicked for that path by people who don't have the actual expertise to make those decisions. So we have and we to gotta be watching that sort of thing. It feels like we have a lot that we should be watching. Like we, we gotta be watching in. everything. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and we need to yeah. remember that the public school system was not designed with our children in mind. Mm -hmm. It has never been fundamentally reshaped to accommodate our children or our children's needs or their interests. That's why we've consistently gotten the short end of the stick. That's why mm -hmm. when I was growing up in South Central LA, we got used textbooks from the white suburbs. You know, and this was in the 80s that mm -hmm. we are still mm -hmm. dealing with the impacts of the legacy of slavery, Jim Crow and white supremacy within our school systems today. So we have to demand um, stronger literacy programs for our kids. Um, and we have to demand that the teaching core looks like our kids. Mm -hmm. But we also need to be training up teachers to be conscious, mm -hmm. even when they look like us and make sure that they're not mm -hmm. also wielding weapons of white supremacy. Because there are some teachers of color who have bought into this notion of white superiority mm -hmm. and they bring that into classrooms with our kids and they can become just as dangerous. And I remind people there were some uh, black overseers on slave plantations. So mm -hmm. don't get it twisted just because mm -hmm. we share the same skin color. What mm -hmm. is your ideology when it comes to uh, black upliftment? Right. Mm -hmm. What are you doing to further the race? Mm -hmm. So we have to be asking those kinds of questions and we need to ask for the numbers, look at the data, and we need to hone in on in, in, in the schools where our children attend. What does it look like in terms of the curriculum? Can we go in and ask to review the curriculum ourselves mm -hmm. and then show up consistently at school board meetings and demand a change after we've looked around and maybe found something better that could be used? Because this isn't rocket science. There are plenty of schools here and around the country that have been successful at teaching black children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what has happened? They've torn down the leaders, these same progressives. Mm -hmm. What did they do to Harvest Prep and, and uh, Eric Mahmoud? 
who was kicking the state's butt mm -hmm. um, with how he was teaching low-income black children. They came after that man and tried to tear him down. And you this know, is another story. I don't think people watching this in, in other places would know this story, but um, we have had black and brown and actually Hmong school leaders here. We have a lot of um, we have a lot of charter schools in the Twin Cities that are run by mom and pop shops. They're not like the chains and they're ethnic community schools. So we have schools for that are mostly kids from West Africa or East Africa. Um, we have Hmong schools. We have um, uh, Native American schools. And those are the schools that white progressive attack more than any. Like they attack those schools. They come for those schools when any little thing is wrong until they actually they can get you run out of town. And they, they really come after you when your results are good. Mm -hmm. That's been the most kind of like uh, um, dispiriting thing to see is that they wait until a school is doing well to actually really go after it. If it's a charter, if it's outside of the, the, the system here. Um, do you think that it would be possible for many people to, to start... You, 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 let me back up. You said to me a long time ago that you would take 12 on fire people before you would take 50 lukewarm people. When you're trying to do an action and you're trying to make something happen, you'll take a handful of people that really are on fire rather than a massive, like trying to organize large group of people. And you and I in small groups have really done some damage mm -hmm. together on these things. I've been amazed by like four or five people, what they can do. Do you think it, it would make sense for people to shift a little bit of their attention to just doing their own equity audit of what goes down in their district? Like you said, get the numbers. It's mm -hmm. all Freedom of Information Act. Like just get, get all the information. Give me the special education data. Give me the graduation data, the math data, the literacy data, all that stuff. And then let us sit away from the system a little bit and just crunch it and Absolutely. look for things. Um and you come armed, you know, with that information. Mm -hmm, you just mm -hmm. keep going, like knocking on the door, right? A lot mm -hmm. of this stuff is biblical. Mm -hmm. When you think about mm -hmm. the widow and the unrighteous judge, and she just kept knocking on the door, look, I want justice from my adversaries. Mm -hmm. And finally, mm -hmm. that judge was like, look, I'm, I'm tired of you bug bugging me. I'm going to get you justice, right? <laughs> right? And even when I talk about the small group of people, I want those who biblically will lap up mm -hmm. water like a dog. Mm -hmm. You look and you watch and you're ready for action. Mm -hmm. You're not standing mm -hmm. there scared. You're not going to run at the first sign of danger. Mm -hmm. You're going to stand in the spirit of our ancestors and fight. Mm -hmm. Right. And it could be a small number of us, but we've shut down school board meetings with five or six people and we've pulled people out the audience. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're about equity. Get up here. Oh, you progressive. Come on up here and join mm -hmm. us then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And we've gotten them to change what they were about to do. So that's where my mentality comes from. Um, in terms of this importance of fighting and being persistent and not giving up. Mm -hmm. And then when all else fails, run for school board, take over mm -hmm. the school board. There's no reason why that cannot happen, right? Mm -hmm. If you are determined to make it happen, it can happen. It might take some time depending on the dynamics within your jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. But um, we are the ones, right? Like one of our ancestors said, we're the ones that we have been waiting for. Mm -hmm. So that might mean you become the decision maker on that school board. And that's what we're seeing here for this next go around. We have uh, quite a number of uh, folks who are planning to run for those seats. And I oh, hope wow. they win. Wow. Yeah. I hope that they win mm -hmm. and they are able to set policy and hold the, the district accountable, hold the administrators accountable and make them provide evidence for what they're saying will actually work. Mm -hmm. And I always push someone had asked earlier about uh, what consists of an equity audit. Can we you know, ha demand that? Yes, you can demand that. And I like to ask for independent equity audits um, where there's an outside reputable uh, firm or organization that's nationally known for what they do, that's not in the pocket of the system, and that's going to really look critically at whatever plans you are putting forward to talk about impact. What is the impact on students of color, right? positive and negative, and that should help form the decision-making, not just making random decisions and then wishing upon a star that it helps students of color. It's not, you have to take a targeted approach. And there are firms that are qualified to be able to do that. Yeah, there's national organizations that come in to do that. Just for people listening and watching, again, I always like to add history. Our own local history is not different than yours. I'm sure whatever city you are in, I don't care if you are in, 
if you're in Tulsa or St. Louis or wherever you are, I'm sure you've got a similar story. But we brought in an, a nationally known group here and we're going to have all of our white teachers take a um, all of our teachers, not just our white teachers, but what was turned out to be mostly white teachers take an IDI or an IDA. I can't remember what it's called. It's like some sort of instrument that you take to see where your biases are. And there was an mm -hmm. immediate revolt. <laughs> there was immediate revolt. White teachers were like, you calling me racist. I don't want to take this. We don't have to. The union got involved, blah, blah, blah. So guess what? The equity group that was like working on that had to go packing. But there was no community of color to say, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Like we no, you're not going to do this. You're going to mm -hmm. actually you're going to follow through with this equity audit um, like you should be. I'm loving this because it's practical, real information that people can use. Mm hmm. Right. Like I think activists should be informed. I don't think you should just, you know, run up talking about anything, shutting down meetings if you don't know what you're shutting it down for. Absolutely. But your approach to me is amazing. Like get the data, get the information, know what you want, know the demand that you want to make mm -hmm. and then take it to them and don't stop. Absolutely. You know? And ask questions. Right. There's sometimes there are folks who work within schools that are just as frustrated as we are, mm -hmm. who might be willing to sit down and have coffee with you and tell you like on the down low, this is what's really going on. Don't use my name, but this is my story, <laughs> right? That's just as valuable in terms of learning what's happening inside of a system so you can bring that information forward. Mm -hmm. And we have, we have had to disrupt school board meetings at times. Now we reserve that disruption for some of the most extreme examples. Uh, I don't know if you recall when the district was trying to install a new superintendent they had in intentionally fumbled the process to lead to, you know, one candidate who was an internal candidate. And they were trying to push that person through in the same meeting where they disqualified the top contender mm -hmm. without any community engagement. We're like, we don't know what, what this person's results have been since they've been in this interim position. Show mm -hmm. us the numbers. What, what have they accomplished that now you're going to go from interim to installing them? And we don't know if we've seen the best of all the candidates. Mm -hmm. Where's the community input? And they wouldn't listen. They were voting on making that decision. And we got up as activists and we shut that meeting down. Mm -hmm. and, and we stood in front. It was five or six of us at first. And then, like I said, we started pulling people up from the audience who had spoken earlier. We're like, come up here and stand with us. And they did. So then we went from like five to like 20 people and we refused to leave. And so guess what? They called the police. Mm -hmm. But we were not afraid. We're like, call them. Do what you mm -hmm. have to do. Mm -hmm. They called the police. The police um, inspector came from the fourth precinct and he asked, who is it? You know, when they told him we were disrupting and he told him it was us. He was like, no, I'm not dealing with this. And he <laughs> left, got back in his car and went away. Yeah. So that meant <laughs> that we, the, the school board had to negotiate with us. Because mm -hmm. we wouldn't leave and they couldn't conduct any of their business. So they're like, well, what do you guys want? We're like mm -hmm. a fair and open community process. Mm -hmm. And so I was a uh, NAACP president at the time. The current president, Leslie Redmond, was our education director. She worked with the district and the community to formulate a process that allowed for community input mm -hmm. where the community could help narrow down the top two candidates. And then the school board chose. And of course, they chose who they wanted. Mm -hmm. But we did force them to engage in a process unlike anything they had ever done before. So mm -hmm. if we had just sat in those seats when we when we saw them making decisions that were not in the best interest of our community, our voices wouldn't have been heard. We had to demand it. So there's all kinds of strategies. Remember, we brought Kermit the Frog dressed in a prison. <laughs> That's <jumpsuit> right. <laughs> to one of the meetings, uh. get them to cancel a contract that we knew was an unfair contract. I think that made the front page of the local paper too. <laughs> Kermit I know the Frog Beth wrote about it in men's post. <laughs> yeah, we hired a young yeah. man to dress as Kermit the Frog wearing a prison jumpsuit. Yeah. And he questioned some of the district's actions with the surrounding contracts. And uh, that contract wound up getting canceled. I mean, that's just the reality. That was we like gotta art do what we and do. activism together. Art plus activism, because yes. people didn't know what to make of it. Why is Kermit in a prison, prison jumpsuit? Jump right, because we're talking <laughs> yeah, about right. the prison pipeline and everything. Uh -huh. And then remember, we posted the picture on social media of Kermit mm -hmm. holding our sign the That's night right. before, and that engaged our community because they knew about Kermit spilling the tea. 
Because yeah. his hashtag was, but that's none of my business. Right. <laughs> After he put out the district's business. So oh. our community just went wild on social media. People were laughing. They got engaged and they were paying attention to the story. Mm. So sometimes as activists, we have to be creative as well. You know, as we know the numbers and the information, you just have to find different ways, you know, to pull on that thread until you begin to see change. I think this is amazing. It's always amazing talking to you. My God sister, Nikima Levy Pounds, executive director of the Wayfinder Foundation, also a member of the Racial du Justice uh, Network, also an advisor to Black Lives Matter, um, civil rights attorney, uh, law professor. There are just so many hats that you have worn, but you are true inspiration in the field. You know I've always admired you and, and <laughs> hold you close to my heart. Like we family at this point, we've been doing this for, for a very long time. Yes. I can see in the comments, people are just like, you know, like, this is amazing, excellent job. We need more people like you. Um, uh, Denisha Fields, and if I'm saying your name wrong, I always say this, contact me, let me know, um, says it costs zero cents to do right by people. Um, it, Christina Laster said, you know, congratulations to a targeted approach. And I think that's your, your level of clarity of knowing what you're doing. I want people to reach out to you if they need um, encouragement um, or if they need um, advice, strategies, because I think you're speaking a lot of people's language. As a matter of fact, Christine, what did you, uh, Christina Laster wrote, you are speaking my love language. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. Um, so I think that's amazing. Um, anyways, is there any other way that you, you think people should find you? Um, so they, they can um, um, find me on Twitter at MV Levy. Um, I'm also on Facebook a lot, Nikima Levy Armstrong. So just send me a friend request uh, or message me, you know, and then I can give you my personal contact information. You can also email me. Um, Nikima Levy pounds at gmail.com. So my name is actually Le Nikima Levy Armstrong. I mm -hmm. changed it from Nikima Levy pounds, mm -hmm. but my email is still Nikima Levy pounds at gmail.com because you can't change it, unfortunately. Awesome. But um, yeah, hit me up if I can be of assistance to you all. And, and I, I want to thank your listeners for the work that they are doing because they're holding it down every day in their communities mm -hmm. and they're often unsung heroes, right? And they're bearing the burden of a failed system. But it is crucial that you continue doing this work and not give up. And thank you, Chris, for always holding it down. Like we've mm. been through some battles together mm. on behalf of our children. And I'm glad that we're continuing to stand up and fight together. And, you know, my son loves you. He's in he's in the feed here saying Nakima for president. Oh, uh, just, so Josh about to run you for president. Just so OMG, you know, you know, Josh loves you. Yes, I love um, Josh, too. Thank you so much uh, to my listeners. Please reach out to either me or to Nakima if you want to keep this conversation going or following up. I'm going to be after Nakima to start her own broadcast and to, to be giving this activist church to people because I feel like her message is something that people need to hear um, wide wide and, and, and broadly. So you guys encourage her to do the same thing and we'll get her to, we'll get her to, to bend and yield and do it. Um, thanks, uh, Nakima, and thank you to the audience. Thank you for having me.